say it again to all of you uh, wonderful women here today. Happy Mother's Day in the year 2024. Uh, hard to believe that, isn't it? Uh, and so in my opinion, whether you are a mother, an aunt, a family member, or a friend or loved one who helps look after children, uh, this day is for you. Uh, you've earned it. And so we honor you and we thank you for uh, all you do in your, in your lives, in your homes, and especially here with our congregation. Uh, you are our wonderful women, and we thank you. Well, today we continue on, though, in our sixth uh, week of our series called yeah. Wonderful Women in the Bible. And in this 13-week series, we are looking, as I say each week, at 13 women that God used in specific times, specific places, and for specific purposes. Uh, so we have been working our way a bit through the Old Testament, and so uh, looking at these wonderful women used by God. We started with Eve, who was the woman who started it all. Then we then we looked at uh, Sarah, who was the mother of nations. And week three was Jochebed, the mother of Moses. Uh, week four was Rahab, uh, the unexpected hero. And last week we looked at Deborah, uh, the woman with power. Uh, today we move on to another wonderful woman today. Today we look at Ruth, a woman of loyalty. Uh, the story of Ruth uh, is a well-known, uh, loved story by many people in the church. Uh, and there are a lot of different lessons that you can get from this book of Ruth and uh, too many for one sermon. So today as we look at Ruth, we get to look at just some of the wonderful things uh, that she does in her story. Uh, so let's start with just a few facts about Ruth. Uh, the name Ruth means friend or companion. Uh, the book of Ruth, it follows the book of Judges in the Bible, which is where we were at last week when we looked at Deborah. Uh, it is, Ruth is the eighth book that we find in the Bible when you look at there. Uh, it's um, a book that is only, but it's the eighth book, but the first verse actually tells us that Ruth is taking place during the time that the Judges govern. So we're still kind of in that same time frame that we were in last week. Uh, the book of Ruth, it's only four chapters long, so it's a quick and easy read, uh, easy to understand for the most part. And from the book of Ruth, we once again will see part of the genealogy that leads to Jesus Christ and how he came through the line of David. Uh, the book of Ruth, it is a key book in the Bible uh, as it connects us to the coming of Jesus through David. The Old Testament, as we know, had prophecies about a Messiah that would come through this line. And without this little four-chapter book right there in this Bible, it would be nearly impossible, if not impossible, for us to connect the house and line of David to the tribe of Judah way back. This is an important link in the chain. You know, if you lose a link in a chain and they become disconnected, the two parts are now separated over time, those two chains could be separated. The ends may be never found and never be pieced back together. The book of Ruth is like that in the Old Testament. It's an important link in the chain of scriptures, as we're going to see at the end today, leading to Jesus. It begins, this whole story, the chain leading to Jesus begins way back in Genesis, goes right down to the stable in Bethlehem and all the way to the cross. And one of the first things that you'll notice about Ruth, if you read the book of Ruth, is that she is a woman of loyalty. It's hard to find someone in the scriptures more loyal than Ruth. Now, what we'll see early on in this book is that times are tough. The first chapter of Ruth opens up by telling us that there is a, a famine in the land and that a man from Bethlehem uh, leaves there and he has to go to the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, who is another key figure in this book of Ruth. And while they were there, Elimelech, the father, dies, leaving Naomi with just her two sons. And so the two sons of Naomi end up marrying Moabite women. One of them married the Moabite Ruth. The people of Moab were wicked. They were evil. They worshipped false gods. They did things like sacrificing their firstborn child in the fire for their god. And Ruth, she's one of these Moabite women. And so once again, just like most of these weeks have been in this series, we are going to see God using a woman that you would not expect. This time it's a woman from Moab. Well, both of 
Naomi's sons died, which leaves Naomi with just her two daughters alone. Times were tough. Ruth had just lost her husband. And during these tough times, Naomi then hears that there is now food back in her homeland. So she sets out to return back to Bethlehem. And this is where we first see that Ruth is a woman of loyalty. When Naomi leaves Moab, both of her daughters-in-law begin to travel with her. They're willing to leave their homeland to go with their mother-in-law. And so Naomi tries to get them to stay there in Moab because there really isn't anything for them in Bethlehem. She's, she doesn't have any other sons, and even if she did, they wouldn't wait that long. And so Orpah, who is the other daughter-in-law to, to Naomi, stays in Moab. But Ruth, well, she shows her loyalty here to Naomi. And she gives us, Ruth does what I would say are probably the most famous words from the book of Ruth. Naomi tries to get Ruth to return to Moab, and this is what we read in verse 16. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you, for where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. I think to me this is one of the boldest, this is one of the most beautiful responses that you can find when it comes to making a decision during a difficult situation. This is a decision that Ruth is willing to make that would stick with her for the rest of her life. And so she basically looks at her mother-in-law and tells her and lets her know and makes it clear that she is not going anywhere without her. She's going to go wherever, wherever Naomi goes. She's going to stay and live wherever she stays. She even goes on so far to say that Naomi, your people will be my people. She even goes on and says, your God will be my God. This is a huge change for Ruth in life. She comes from a land, as I said, that worshiped false gods. But she was so loyal to her mother-in-law, she's willing to change her whole life. Loyalty. It's something that you could say is difficult to find in our world today. You know, I wonder what would happen. If we applied the same standards, if each of us individuals, if we applied the same standards of loyalty to our Christian activities as we expect from other areas of our lives. You know, if your car started at once out of every three tries, would you consider it reliable? If you didn't go to work several times throughout the month, are you a reliable employee? If your refrigerator stops uh, every day or two, would you just say, well, it works most of the time? If your water heater just gave you nothing but icy cold showers, would you think it's dependable? If you skipped a couple of electric bill payments, do you think that they would just say, that's fine, don't worry about it, we'll just let it go? If you fail to worship God one or two Sundays a month, would you expect to be called faithful? You see, we expect loyalty. And we expect reliability from all of our things and from other people. And so it's reasonable then that God would expect the same from us. But what does he get sometimes? You know, I think if we look deep inside and we see that God isn't getting loyalty from us, we've got to ask ourselves, what am I going to do about it? And I, mean, I think we get it. Life is tough, isn't it? We have a lot of things going on. We have a lot of places we have to be. We have a lot of things we have to take care of. But if God is only getting our leftovers, if we are only being loyal to God when we don't have something else we would rather do, is that being loyal to God? Now, I'm not talking about if you're out of town or if you're having to work, you have to provide for your families. I think we get that. Uh, but I think the question becomes for us, if God is truly only getting my loyalty when I don't have something else I want to do, what do I need to do different? Because you see, we want God to provide for us. We want God to be there for us. We want God to answer our prayers. We want God to answer our prayers the way we want them answered and in our time frame. We want what we want from God, but sometimes we really don't care some people, if, if, if we give God what he wants or not. So sometimes in our world, things like missing church 
on Sunday mornings or Wednesdays is just easy in our world. Even though we know what the Hebrew writer warned us about. In Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, he wrote this. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, choosing not to fellowship together or assemble together, as the Hebrew writer puts it, choosing to do something else instead is nothing new. As it says there, there were some people that were in the habit of doing that in that time as well. But how can we do what these verses say? How can we stimulate one another to love and good deeds? How can we encourage one another if we aren't either interested enough or loyal enough to fellowship with church family? You know, I know many of you will do everything you can to do your best to fellowship with your church family. You make it a priority, which is what those verses in Hebrews are getting at. I know we have some here who would love to be in this church every time the doors are open, when we assemble together, when we gather, but for health reasons or whatever, you can't. I get that. God gets that. And I might be saying some things that people don't want to hear, and I'm saying some things for some of you that these words do not apply to you at all. And sometimes saying things like this will upset people, but loyalty is something God expects from us. Loyalty to his word. Loyalty to his church and to his family. And I'll be honest, there have been plenty of times where I wonder if it's something I'm doing or have done wrong for someone. You know, I don't know. One thing I hope Double Creek will always strive to be is a church like we see in the book of Acts. As soon as the church began in Acts chapter 2, we see what they were all about. Sure, they assembled together in some form of fashion like we do today, like this. It wasn't in a nice building, they weren't in comfortable pews and all this, but they assembled together and gathered together. They studied their scriptures like we study our Bible. But church was so much more than just that. The church we read about in Acts is a church that was fully devoted, fully committed, and they were loyal after they made that commitment. This is what we read in Acts 2.42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. These are things they did continually. In other words, you can say they couldn't get enough of it. It was a church that encouraged each other. It was a church that loved God first, loved others, and served both. And I hope we're always that type of church here. Because church is so much more than just meeting together. It's so much more than, as some people would see it, following a bunch of rules in a book. We need to do those things. But the church is a family. The church is the body of Christ. And I love our family here. I think we have a great family atmosphere. You see, we don't need to be like a church down the road. We don't need to be like some church in Winston-Salem or some other place. We need to be a church like the church in Acts. It was a church that was full of committed and loyal people. See, while loyalty to God and his people may be something lacking in our world today, it certainly was not lacking in the life of Ruth. Ruth makes a, a genuine decision for God in that first chapter. She says, basically, she's willing to be an outcast. She's going to a, a land that she's different from them. She's willing to live in poverty. Think about it. I'm pretty sure that Naomi's husband did not have a life insurance plan. I'm sure he didn't have a large number of stocks that she could fall back on. He didn't have a large savings account, I'm sure. See, Ruth was even willing to accept the fact that she might be a widow. For the rest of her life. She was willing to accept all of that. And she ends up taking a stand for God. She makes the decision to go to Bethlehem with Naomi. A place that would be new to her. With people living a different lifestyle than what she was used to. And different beliefs than what she had believed. That was Ruth's decision. She was a woman of loyalty. But she was more than just a loyal woman. She was a woman of dedication. To be dedicated means that you are devoted to a cause, an idea, or a purpose. 
And so when they get to Bethlehem, it was the beginning of barley harvest. At this time, they didn't have much, Ruth and Naomi. They had no man to provide for them, which is what men did a lot during those days. But Naomi had a kinsman of her husband named Boaz. He was a great man of wealth. And this is what we read in chapter 2 of Ruth and verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. Now, when we see Ruth asking, pleading here to go glean, she's not asking to do something fun. Gleaning is just going around and collecting what is left over from a farmer's crop after the good stuff has already been collected. And so this helps us to understand something here. Ruth and Naomi are poor at this time. They're the ones that have to go around gleaning, picking up all the leftovers. And the fact that Ruth says she wants to go and glean lets us know really the state of their poverty. They needed something to eat. See, Ruth wasn't just tagging along with Naomi for a free ride. She was dedicated. She was 100% willing to work. And the dedication that she has leads her to the right field. Look at what the third verse says. It says, So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. It's an interesting verse for a couple of reasons right there. Well, we see Ruth first going to work. But we also see where she ends up. If you had seen Ruth walking down the road near Bethlehem that day, you, you might have seen someone uh, walking around uh, looking for a good field to work in and maybe seen someone not knowing where she should go. I don't know what she looked like, but that would be okay because God was at work in this process. So how would she find her way into the field of Boaz? And it was very important that she find her way to his field. Remember this. This is Bethlehem. This is a place where Jesus would eventually be born. And so if Ruth doesn't find this field of Boaz, a man God had put in her life, a man who was willing to accept her even though she was from Moab, if she wanders off to another field and cleans, it would have messed so much up. The Messiah had to come through this line from Bethlehem. Now, this is no way on her mind. She has no idea what is eventually going to happen. But you see, it's so important that she went into the right field. And her dedication pays off. Because she, when she gets out there, when she's working in that field, someone notices her. And it's Boaz. And here's what happens when you have someone who is both loyal and someone who is dedicated to God. What that person will do is follow God's purpose. That's what you see in Ruth. A woman who follows God. Remember what Ruth said to her mother-in-law way back in that first chapter? She told her at the end that her God would be her God. She had worshipped false gods in Moab. There's no doubt about that. But when she goes with Naomi, she becomes a woman who follows the one true living God. Which is extremely important. Pay attention to what God continues to do. Boaz and Ruth, they had this kind of connection. It's kind of a little love connection going on. But there's another kinsman. A closer relative. And so in their culture, that meant the closer relative had first dibs on buying the land that Naomi now owned. And this closer relative was willing to do that when Boaz approaches him. Until Boaz tells him, well, if you buy the land, then you've got to take Ruth the Moabite as your wife as well. When he hears that, he refuses. And that leaves Boaz as the man to marry Ruth. We read that Boaz takes Ruth and she becomes his wife and they have a son. And this is what we read at the end of Ruth in chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Once again, why is this so important? Why is this story, this book of Ruth, so significant? You know, when you get into this book and you really get into it, a lot of it is also about Boaz and the role he plays. 
But think about the things that take place in this book of Ruth. It starts in this book of Ruth. It starts with a famine and a funeral, and it ends with a wedding. Ruth goes to glean, and Boaz is generous. Finally, we come to the house of Boaz, where a family was made, and this was a special family. They were known, they were well loved by all in Bethlehem. The elders, the women, everyone that's in this city was happy for Ruth and for Boaz. Just like we're happy when someone in our church family or people we know has a child. The book ends by giving us a record of the genealogy that takes us all the way back to Judah, who is the father of Perez. The ending of Ruth, it's one of the most important sections in the Old Testament, in all of the Old Testament. The last five verses of Ruth trace the family of David all the way back to the tribe of Judah. Remember, Boaz and Ruth, they are the great-grandparents of King David. The Messiah had to come through this line of people. And so we've seen that a few times already in this series. People, women that God chose who were in the line of the Messiah, like Sarah Rahab, the prostitute, Ruth, the Moabite woman. Ruth is one of only three women to be mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. It starts with Abraham, goes all the way to Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. The other women were Rahab, the Canaanite woman, the prostitute, which we looked at in week 4. The other woman would be Mary. The mother of Jesus, which we will look at in week 10. This book of Ruth, the story of Ruth is extremely important for all of history. It's easy to see why Ruth is one of the wonderful women in the Bible. So Ruth, a woman of loyalty. While today may not have been your typical, I guess, Mother's Day sermon, think about this. Remember that Ruth was a Moabite woman. She was not an Israelite. And just like Rahab in week four of this series, God used a woman who was not an Israelite to do his work. God does it here again in week six with Ruth. And so when God calls us to do something, he'll lead us through it. It may not be quick. It may not be easy and it may not be painless. But in his timing, whether here on earth in our lifetime or when Jesus returns and we receive our glory, God will make it worthwhile. Ruth was a woman of loyalty. When times were tough, she was loyal and dedicated. And remember, when we are loyal and dedicated to God, we'll follow God. And so as we finish today, today is Mother's Day. Maybe you came expecting something totally different than what you got. But understand this, we're doing this wonderful Women in the Bible series. And today we have seen in Ruth a person we can truly learn how to live from it. And that's for all men and women. But if all mothers were loyal and dedicated and followed God, then they're able to teach their children to do the same. We don't have enough of that in our world. And that goes for men too. But I know in this church, we have a lot of Ruth people. I love it. I see the loyalty many of our women to God. I see their loyalty to this congregation, to God's family. And if you don't see yourself in that light, know this, it's not too late to be a Ruth person. Be a Ruth person in a world that desperately needs it. Ruth truly is one of the wonderful women in the Bible. I want to thank you for joining us here this morning for week six. Um, God has called us to be loyal, dedicated people. And when we are, we will follow him. Ruth is such a beautiful story. I want to encourage you to just go home and read those four chapters. In 15 minutes, you'd be done with reading that book. It's a great read, uh, but there's so much we can learn from it as well. Um, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation here. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you always have that opportunity to do so. To put your faith in Jesus Christ, to confess him, uh, to repent, uh, to be immersed in the waters of baptism, uh, to live a faithful life. Ruth shows us how to be loyal and dedicated to God. God calls us to do the same. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation here this morning. Our hymn of invitation is going to be song number 184, first and last verses, standing as you are able, whiter than snow.